Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation to come here and talk to you today. Um, I'm going to address one particular part of the TTC approach, and that is the Kramer classification. Oh, the microphone seems to be clicking in and out. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. Um, I'm just going to talk about the Kramer cl classification and others later on this morning will talk about other aspects of the TTC scheme as a whole, I'm sure. So, as you've already uh, heard from Dr. Munk, um, there's very little information that is required as a prerequisite for the TTC approach. Um, the first essential is that you know the chemical structure of the untested substance that you're dealing with, and you also need to have good exposure data. Um, I won't be talking about the exposure side of the equation at the moment, uh, at this talk, but I'm sure others will later. So I'm going to focus on the structural classes that were devised by Kramer, Ford and Hall, who were scientists who were principally working in the context of evaluating flavouring materials many years ago. Um, and I just wanted to discuss at the start what is the thinking behind um, their scheme. Um, we already know in toxicology that you, if you have substances um, like, say, these three here, which are very closely structurally related, that you can use read across to predict the possible toxicology of an untested member of a group like this. So this particular uh, group of compounds related to aniline, we know from testing these chemicals that they all can cause potentially met hemoglobinemia, albeit at different doses, they have different potencies, and as a result of the met hemoglobinemia, they can also cause hemolysis. And we also know that that's due to um, the production of common hydroxy hydroxylamine metabolites. So taking this thought about very closely related molecules, what Kramer, Ford and Hall did was to ask the question, can this approach be extended to the world of chemicals in general um, using much broader structural classes in order to predict likely toxic potency which would um, mean that such substances could at least have an initial evaluation without animal testing. Or you could give a view about a substance that, say, had popped up in the food chain, um, even if there was no animal test results or laboratory test results on that chemical. So um, the way their thinking went was that if you, have, if you identify functional groups on chemicals, and some of those could be grouped together, um, and at least you could classify them into a group of um, low suspect toxicity, medium suspect toxicity, and high suspicion for toxicity. But they did emphasize that you couldn't actually predict the nature of their toxicity. You couldn't say what type of toxicity um, you might expect, but you might at least be able to say, we think this compound might be toxic, or we think there's a very low probability of this compound being toxic. So what Kramer, Ford and Hall did um, was to develop their decision tree, and uh, they um, used four rules, basically, back in 1978 to decide on how the tr decision tree would run. The first was the then knowledge about the toxicity conferred by certain structural groups. And I would emphasize that the knowledge at that time um, was substantially less than we have available today, which is one of the problems that we'll come on to in discussing whether Kramer classes are fit for purpose. They also asked the question of whether the substance occurs naturally in food. Um, nowadays, I think many people would think just because it occurs naturally in food, that doesn't confer low toxicity. Um, but that was the thinking back in 1978. Whether it's naturally present in the body, that seems like a reasonable question 
to put. Um, if it is, then presumably it's of low potential toxicity. And the knowledge then back in 78 about what was known about metabolism of the substances. And so they put the substances into three classes. Um, class one, they briefly define those as substances with simple structure, with efficient metabolism that suggested a low order of toxicity. Other substances went into class three, um, structures that permit no strong initial presumption of safety or which actually suggest significant toxicity. And then there was a kind of leftover class, class two, that we'll talk more about in a minute, um, anything that couldn't be put into class one or class three. And I've put in, uh, sorry, I've put some of these words in a different colour here because I want to emphasise that the TTC is a probability-based tool. It's not a sure, uh, completely assured prediction. It's a probability-based tool. And you can see right back in the area of just which structural class you assign a chemical to, um, it's all about probability, suggesting a low order of toxicity, no initial presumption of, of safety. Now, the decision tree itself, you've already seen um, uh, a copy of it earlier. I'm going to show it in a bit more detail. It's a series of 33 questions applied in sequence. And as I've said, the logic of the questions was ba based on what was available to those scientists in 1978. And it's important to emphasize that um, although the scheme relates to chemical features, and those that are known to be associated with toxicity. It's not, it doesn't work like an expert system like QSAR, which is designed to give you a much more accurate prediction about the nature of the toxicity of the chemical. So TTC only addresses the likelihood of toxicity of any type of a chemical. So this is the decision tree that you saw earlier, the original one from the publication. And it's a series of questions that start with question one and end up with question 33. And as you go through the sequence, your chemical may, at an early stage or a later stage, fall out into one of these classifications of class three or class one or, or class two. Difficult to find the two. There's the two. And in general, if you have Alicyclic compounds, they tend to fall out around that part of the decision tree. If you have aromatics, they tend to fall out about there. And if you have heterocyclics, they tend to fall out about there. And class one is the low toxicity chemicals, class two are the medium, and class three are the chemicals that are suspect for toxicity. So that's the way the scheme works, just to give you an idea of um, what kinds of compounds would be classified. Sorry, that was me standing on the, the lead there. Um, under, each class, under each Kramer class. So for class one, um, normal constituents of the body would fall out as class one, excluding hormones. Actually, if you had a hormone as your substance that you're investigating, you would know all about it from animal testing and human evidence. You wouldn't even need to put a known hormone through TTC. Um, sim simply branched acyclic aliphatic hydrocarbons would be class one, common carbohydrates and terpenes, and substances that are sulfonate or sulfamate salts without any free primary amines. These would all fall into class one. But the key thing when you're Thinking about TTC is this bottom line here, which is that any substance that has anything other than carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or divalent sulfur is excluded from class one. And that applies, of course, to many, many, many chemicals. So you can see why it is that not so many chemicals fall out into class one, even fewer into class two, and the majority of chemicals will fall into class three. Class two is common components of food, um, some of which might actually be toxic if they were taken in high amounts. Um, and then, then there's this long description, which I'm not going to go through, <laughs> of um, other substances that can fall out into 
class two. This is a kind of, class two is a kind of rag bag of whatever doesn't go into class one or class three. So it has this very long description here of what kinds of com compounds might be like that. So these are just examples of what would be in class two. And examples of what would be in class three are, as I said, anything that contains elements other than the <coughs> carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or divalent sulfur, certain benzene derivatives, certain heterocyclic substances, and aliphatic substances containing more than three types of functional groups. So there was a recognition that the more functional groups you get attached to a seemingly innocuous aliphatic substance, the much more your likelihood of toxicity increases. And indeed, I said uh, earlier, the majority of substances fall into class three. And if you take a group of substances like pesticides, nearly every single one, or pesticide metabolites, nearly every single one would fall into class three. So is the, is the decision tree very difficult to use? Well, um, you can either do it manually by reading the original 1978 paper and going through the questions, which are, as well as the decision tree you've seen, the questions are all listed in detail in the paper. Um, but there is software um, available on the JRC website, um, which you can see at the bottom here, um, to help you um, do your Kramer classification. And this ToxTree software is um, readily available. It's very easy to use. I'm not a chemist, and even I can manage to, to use it without too much difficulty. It can run on various platforms. And you can download it and actually modify it to suit your particular purpose, um, if you so wish. So you could in incorporate some extra rules if you wanted to. Um, <coughs> the JRC commissioned idea consult to prepare this software and it's been running through several versions and at the time I made up my slide I thought that the last version was 2011 um, but I just heard from Andrew Worth at JRC who's um, very much involved with this that they have just put a new version in July this year up on um, the site the ToxTree site so you're looking at version 2.6.0 now if you go to the website and as they the reason they are uploading new versions is as more and more people use it they discover problems little problems with it and so they have slightly adjusted it um, as time has gone on to try and uh, eliminate the problems so this ToxTree software will allow you to import your chemical either as a drawn chemical structure or you can use the chemical name or the CAS number, or you can simply obtain the SMILES code um, that describes the molecule. And um, it then, the software takes the structure that you've put in sequentially through the questions and tells you which class it falls out into. And this is just, you won't be able to read this, this is not essential, this is just to give you an idea of the screenshot you'll see. So here we have question one, is it a normal constituent of the body? And so here we have a chemical here, which some of you may recognize as cytosine, important building block of DNA. And so that comes out as a normal constituent of the body. The answer is yes, and it's classified in class one um, with the very first question. There won't be too many substances that fall out like that, um, because uh, if something's a normal constituent of the body, you probably wouldn't, um, if you knew that, you probably wouldn't even bother to put it through the scheme. You would just say, I don't think this is a problem, unless the amounts that were being consumed were inadvertently huge. So if you don't get the answer with your first question, you then proceed down with these other, other uh, questions. And this slide and the next slides I'm going to show have all been um, obtained uh, with his permission from... Andrew Worth at the JRC. And here's another question. We try that one out. So is it a common component of food? So here on the right, we have a flavor, flavoring material, ethyl maltol, um, which is a common component of food. So that would fall out at question 22 as being a class two compound of 
perhaps intermediate toxicity. And then another type of question uh, later on in the scheme um, is question 29, is it readily hydrolyzed? And so we have quite a complex substance here, but in fact it's hydrolyzed. So you would then treat each of these separately in order to classify each one um, for its Kramer classification. So it does cope with hydrolyzed substances. And this is just to give you an idea of what else you can find on tox tree. So this is an example of a toxic compound, vinclozolin, a pesticide. And in addition to its Kramer class, which is high toxicity class 3, um, here's the structure of the compound. It also gives you other information um, that might be useful to you um, about the substance itself. And here it tells you how it's classified in, in class 3. Which question did it fall out at here? Question 3 and so on. And question 4. So it came out as class 3. So I'm now going to um, just spend the last part of my talk talking about um, how have people tried since 1978 to valid validate this decision tree approach that Kramer um, proposed. Well, Kramer and colleagues themselves did first try to validate their um, <coughs> decision tree. Um, they only had about 80 80 or so substances at the time with data on toxicological properties, and these were drawn from pesticides, drugs, industrial chemicals, food additives, etc. And the Noel distributions of these three classes were plotted, and they found they were reasonably well separated, but they had some overlap. So when Munro came along in 1996 and did the plotting, um, in fact, the idea came originally from Kramer, Ford, and Hall. And you saw earlier with Dr. Munk's presentation that when Munro plotted the three classes of Noels in their database of 613 substances, they had a similar thing. They were separated, but some overlap. Um, and at the time, Kramer, Ford and Hall said, well, we know this decision tree um, is not going to last, um, last forever because it's a compromise between discrimination and complexity. And as time goes on, future toxicological knowledge will allow this decision tree to be much better refined, hopefully. Um, another evaluation of um, the tox tree Kramer um, decision tree um, has been done by the JRC and uh, they wrote round to a lot of users of tox tree and asked what problems there were <coughs> with uh, using it for Kramer classification. And they got back the information that a lot of the rules are not very clear, um, and it's difficult to rationalize, all, in every case, the predictions that are made by the tox tree. Um, they also highlighted that two of the rules are not based on chemical features. Um, that is, um, is it a normal constituent of the body? Is it a normal constituent of food? Um, but they simply make reference to lookup lists. So this particular, these two particular rules depend on what list you look up. Um, the JRC have expanded um, the list of common food components um, in their tox tree, but of course it could be um, expanded further. Um, there's also a problem that some of the rules make ambiguous references to chemical features such as steric hindrance, and that needs to be clarified. And a number of studies have also identified outliers, that is, class one compounds that have low NOLs. Um, and a revised scheme should be more discriminating in terms of NOL values. And many of the people who've published on TTC have all reached the same conclusion that we really need to make this more discriminative if we can, but at, at present, nobody's come up with a way of doing that. And this last one um, is particularly important, um, that we don't put in class one compounds that 
are actually toxic. And the prime example of that that I usually like to mention is that at the time that Kramer, Ford and Hall were working in 1978, we had no idea that phthalates have the extensive um, cross-species toxicity that they now, we now know that they have. And phthalates would be classified in class one under the original Kramer decision tree. So that's just a glaring example of a problem. There are undoubtedly other compounds in class one about which we now have better knowledge and perhaps should not be there. So there's definitely a need to update the scheme. Um, so the JRC did introduce modifications to the decision tree that you find in the ToxTree software. They extended the rule base and um, this rule base recognises more substances as natural constituents of the body. Um, they've raised it from 67 up to 400. It allows harmless phosphates to be identified. <coughs> These previously were automatically assigned to class 3. It classifies more benzene-like substances as class 3 than before. And it recognises the potential toxicity of non-divalent sulfur-containing compounds. These are also assigned to class 3. And alpha, beta, unsaturated compounds, which occur commonly in the area of flavorings, are classified as class 3 instead of class 1 or 2, because the alpha, beta, unsaturated configuration is an alert um, for toxicity. Um, another validation has been carried out um, uh, under contract work done for EFSA by SIN, Soluzioni Informatiche, and they uh, did this work as background to the opinion that EFSA published in 2012 on um, the use of TTC in EFSA's work. And what they did was SIN took experimental data on chronic toxicity of the chemicals in the Monroe database and the carcinogenic potency database and they devised their own experimental classification um, by categorising the NOEL values or the TD50 values according to arbitrary thresholds. And they were arbitrary in that they just wanted um, to make sure that the chemicals divided roughly, very roughly, into about similar numbers for each group. So you can see they ended up with 168 in the low hazard group, 227 and 192. So here we have on the left the hazard level. Here is the way they took the experimental data. They converted all the milligrams per kilogram body weight per day into moles per kilogram body weight per day because that's a much better scientific way of comparing chemical toxicities. That incidentally is one of the criticisms of the Munro scheme is that it uses milligrams per kilogram. They um, took the log of one over the Noel and if the log of 1 over Noel was less than 2, that was low hazard. Um, if it was between 0.2 and 1.5, um, it was medium. And if it was greater than 1.5, it was high. And then, using those three experimental classes that they defined on the that you can see on the previous slide, they then compared this classification with the Kramer classification. So if we look at this column, 80 substances in the Munro database come out as experimentally low hazard and also um, are class one. Um, but it's interesting that class one low hazard, quite a lot of them are classified by Kramer as high hazard. And this is a feature of the Kramer decision tree. It tends to be very conservative and regulatory <coughs> advisors and regulatory bodies like that. They want a very conservative system. The problem area is this one here, where you can see that th um, things experimentally which ought to be high hazard, considered as high hazard, 10 out of 192 were actually classified by Kramer as low hazard. But if you look at it overall, you've got 74% of chemicals um, from Munro are in class 3, um, less than 5% are classified 
as low hazard if they're actually experimentally high hazard. So this begins to tell you about the errors in TTC. Your chances of making a mistake could be as high as 5%. <coughs> they also did the same for uh, carcinogenicity, but in the interest of time, I'll admit these, omit these two slides. Just to say again on the carcinogenicity side, um, 8.5% of the experimentally carcinogenic studies were classified as low hazard. But although this work was done by SIN, in fact, it's not completely relevant to the use of TTC, um, because if you have something that has a genotoxicity alert, um, you wouldn't be using the class 1, class 2, or class 3 TTC values. You'd be using much lower values. So SIN's work led to several conclusions that the Kramer scheme is highly conservative. It performs much better in identifying high hazard compounds than low ones, and that's what you really are seeking from an, a screening tool. Misclassification is possible, but it's likely to be somewhere in the range of 0 to 5 percent chance of misclassification. And they did some further work trying to see if they could um, break the class 1 and class 3 substances in the Munro database down into um, other subclasses to see if that would provide a better model. And it didn't with those 600 or so substances in the Munro database. <coughs> There's also been work done in Germany by Kalkoff and, and colleagues that's been published. And they took industrial chemicals that have been tested according to OECD 28-day and 90-day toxicity tests, and they applied uncertainty factors to account for the shorter duration of the toxicity to work out um, their comparative toxicity, perhaps on a, on a longer-term basis, excluding carcinogenicity. And they found that 90% of these industrial chemicals were in class 3. And they then compared it with the global harmonization scheme for classification, and they found only 22% were classified by GHS in the highest tox category, compared with the 90% in class 3. So this again illustrates um, how Kramer um, over-predicts toxicity and illustrates how conservative it is. And finally, EFSA um, published its opinion on in 2012 about um, the TTC scheme as a whole. And these are just their conclusions about Kramer from within that opinion. And they um, were of the view that the scheme, for the Kramer scheme should be revised and, re and refined in the light of knowledge since 1978. Um, in that regard, um, WHO is beginning to um, work out how to take some initiative in that area. But although everybody's been saying for a long time Kramer should be revised and refined, um, perhaps the best way to do it would be to, take, to add many more chemicals, say, to the Munro database and recalculate the TTC values all over again. But I think you can imagine the immense amount of work that's involved in that. And so far, nobody has come forward to do that kind of work or put up the money to do that kind of work. The other thing that um, EFSA said was that all class 2 substances should be treated as class 3 because there are very few substances in class 2 to support the Munro TTC value for class 2. They also said OPs and carbamates should be separately identified and they have a TTC value that's lower than the class 3 one. But they concluded at the end that application of the existing Kramer classification scheme is conservative and therefore likely to be protective of human health and is suitable for EFSA's work when it's faced with giving advice on substances for which there, is, there are no toxicity data. This is the EFSA scheme. I'm not going to go through it because others are going to <coughs> discuss it in more detail later. So, finally, um, using the uh, Kramer decision tree, you have a chance of misclassifying a high hazard substance as a low hazard substance, and that ra ranges from 0 to 5%. And I think anybody using the TTC scheme should have this at the front of their mind all the time. The context in which you're using it, can you afford 
to have a possibility of 5% of making a mistake. If you can't afford that possibility or you think that's too risky in the circumstances of the, of the substance you're trying to evaluate, then TTC is not the way to go, though you might want to do it as an initial screening. Um, the tree can certainly be improved by further revisions and refinements, and JRC have done some of that work already, um, but more is needed to be done. Um, there is a, a move amongst um, some people working in this area to try and further subdivide the three main classes, and um, by looking at the detailed toxicology of particular groups. And this would rather convert TTC into a read-across rather than a general screening tool. And EFSA was not really um, in favour of keep trying to make this into a very sophisticated tool with lots of subclasses, because it's, it's not a sophisticated tool. It's a general tool and uh, based on a certain number of uncertainties. And the more detailed it gets, the more people think it's a reliable and certain situ uh, tool. But they did say, uh, and I think many people agree, that the Kramer decision tree is sufficiently conservative that it can be used either in its original form or with the extended rule base from Tox tree in the meantime, until such time in the future as we might have a more refined classification scheme. So thank you very much. Thank you.